G'day, I'm Mitch and welcome to Lounge Room Hobbies. This time, reimagining a bloodthirster. I stumbled across the first video for Lounge Room Hobbies and I figured I'd start with a classic model. The Corn uh, Greater Demon, a bloodthirster. In this case, there's like three now. This is from a point in time where there were really only, there was one and this was your option. Uh, it's a metal model, so you know, heavy enough to bludgeon someone to death and spiky enough to uh, cause myself injury while painting it. I'm opening this with the, the start of a new army for myself, but with an old model. And this time you can follow along as I paint it. So, digging through my parents' garage, I managed to find this classic Bloodthirster, which I'd uh, butchered with several layers of paint. So with a quick tooth brushing, nail polish removing, and putting in enough pins to arouse an orthopedic surgeon, it's time to get painting. So, starting point, and you know, the point that I didn't film, because you know I'm not smart enough to figure out that I wanted to do this until I'm halfway through a project, was Cleaning him up, removing all of the past mistakes with some nail polish remover, a toothbrush, and uh, a little bit of elbow grease. Uh, next step was obviously a black undercoat, hitting it with corn red all over as a base coat, and then a dry brush of Mephiston red. Uh, the point where I actually have video footage um, is when I come in with the Evil Sun Scarlet highlight. But taking Evil Sun Scarlet, uh, and thinning it down a little bit, I'm aiming to pick out all of the muscle detail across the entire model. Uh, this is from you know, arms, shoulders, and up the wings. Uh, the key thing here was to try and leave some of that Mephiston red that I'd left in place while building up edge highlights. Following the Evil Sun Scarlet, it was Bloodletter Glaze. Uh, I'm reliably informed that you can't actually get the Games Workshop glaze paints anymore, but if you have some lying around, or if you want to use a really watered down red paint, you can do the same thing. Apply this all over the red on the model. This is designed to try and tie in all of the layers and the base coats together and it just smooths transitions. Final step for the skin, Wild Rider Red. This is a kind of part orange, part red, really bright color that I come in through on an edge highlight that I focus predominantly around the face of the Bloodthirster. So you can see here that I'm picking out things like his eyebrows, lips, uh, and some of the lines on his neck. I also used it to pick out some of the stronger muscles around his arms and hands, but this one didn't go into the wings, leaving them as a kind of mid-toned red that doesn't steal focus from the face. Next step was to go back through and rebase coat the wing membrane black. Uh, this is just obscuring all of the terrible, terrible base coating work I've managed to do with red across the model, giving me a smooth canvas to work on. Next, I take Dark Reaper Blue, and dry brush that onto the wings. This is a great blue for this particular task because it's very dusky, rather than tending towards the more fluoro blues that Games Workshop make. Having built up the dry brush using Dark Reaper, I then take two washes, Null Noil and Drakenhof Nightshade, and apply it to the wing membrane. I'm focusing the Null Noil into the edges of the wing membrane while taking the Drakenhof Nightshade along the center point, giving me a really dark edge shadow while st starting to add some blue tones into the middle points. While I had the Null Noil out, it's at this point that I started applying the first of many, many, many washes to his shoulders, back, and around his hooves. This is designed to build up a, a transition into a darker shade across the model. After the washes had dried on the wing membranes, I came back through with Dark Reaper with another dry brush, this time focusing on the centers of the membrane. This is really aimed to up the, up the highlight through the center while leaving those shadows in place. Following that dry brush, again, taking one of the glaze paints. If you can't get it, use a really bright blue, watered down to the consistency of about milk. Granted, if you can figure out what paint consistency it look like milk is, please let me know. Taking the Gilliman Blue Glaze, I apply this across the entire surface of the wings, which gives me this kind of dark but fluoro pop of color. I guess is the best way to describe it. Uh, that just ties the wing membrane together and ups it a step while also keeping it quite dark. Taking Lead Belcher, I applied a base coat to the axe handle, the chains around his wrists, and his hanging tabard that I'd built. This was followed by applying Runefang Steel to the axe head alone, giving me two different tones of silver. While this was drying, I then applied another coat of Nolan Oil to the shoulders, around his hooves, and down his back, again building up that tone. Using Mechanicus Standard Grey, I applied a base coat to the fur on his wrists, and over the top of his head. In particular, I was really careful to water this down while focusing on the hairs coming off the top of his head so that they got a smooth blend from the red and black tones that I'd already applied through the Null Noil washes into this new grey. 
I next applied another Null and Oil wash, this time focused on the metals across the model, the grey that I just applied, and a third coat for his ankles, shoulders, and down his back. At this point, the Null and Oil washes have built up enough opacity across the model to leave only red showing at the very highest points. Coming in with the Screamer Pink highlight, I applied this all around the muscles to create definition, and focusing on the harder edges around his ankles. This builds up a kind of bruised, scarred texture that creates a point of difference across this red model. I used Administratum Grey to highlight the fur and his hair. For the fur, I focused on picking out individual strands focused around the top and bottom of the wrists. And for his hairline, I focused initially on picking out the individual kind of coiled ribbons that form his hair at the front of his face before drawing lines upwards along the coils. This means that I can avoid highlighting each individual sculpted detail, but still give a highlight that looks effective across the entire model. Next, I take Gawthor Bone and apply a base coat layer to the horns on his head, on his wings, and some of the skulls attached to his belt and dangling from his tabard. It was at this point that I realized that attaching the tabard that moved maybe wasn't the best option while trying to paint it. I tried a number of different ways to try and secure the skull, including a small pair of pliers, before managing to pin it between my fingers to get a base coat on. The Gawthor Bone base coat was followed by a quick wash of Agrax Earthshade. In particular, I tried to focus this around the front tips of the horns on his head as I was trying to build highlights that pointed towards his face rather than away from it. I next applied a highlight to the horns on his head and wings using Karak Stone. I was aiming to build highlights that were lighter towards the base of the horns on his head. To do this, I started towards the bottom of the horn and drew my brush upwards, leaving thin streaks of the Karak Stone. I wasn't too concerned if these met each other, but the aim here was to leave the Gawthor brown and Agrax toned brown underneath it, showing towards the tips of the horn underneath the brass plating. For the horns on his wings, this was reversed. I wanted the highlight points to be towards the tips of these bones, implying a sharpened tip. I then took a final highlight of Vishabti bone to the antler horns only. This again needed to be a very fine highlight that ensured I left the Gawthor brown and Ushabdi bone showing through underneath so that I got the tonal graduations. I used warp block bronze to base coat the brass armour. This in particular was the chest plate that he's wearing and the runes across his shoulders. This done, I applied an Agrax Earthshade wash to the brass armour. Now for the really fun bit. Old bronze and copper tend to pick up verdigris, a discoloration that comes from the copper in the metal oxidizing. This tends to be a blue or green, and for these models, I just feel that they're not gonna have time to clean their armor of the blood, and they're more likely to get beaten, dirty, and weathered. So, taking Temple Guard Blue, I watered this down to the point where you can almost see the pigment separating in the water, and apply this as a wash, focusing it into the recesses of the model and around rivets. Where I felt it was too much, I just took a damp brush and wiped it away, leaving it showing in the recesses. I wasn't too concerned as I'd come through with further highlights to touch up any of the areas if there were some. With the Vertigris wash dry, I used Hashnut Copper to re-highlight the brass. Focusing on the trim, the raised edges of icons and around the sculpted musculature of his torso. Uh, a strange uh, break in the painting schedule there as I uh, just had to go and call the fire brigade to get some people out of a lift. So uh, without much ado, <laughs> we'll go back to painting a bloodthirster. Having returned from the foyer, I picked up the final highlights in Hashnut Copper before moving on to Rune Lord Brass. This is a final, very silver copper that I applied again sparingly across the edges of the armour and around the icons. I used Sibrite Green to base coat the gums and mouth of the Bloodthirster. A very green blue that will work as a strong contrast against the red of his body. It was at this point that I decided that the wash applied to the Runefang steel probably wasn't dark enough, so I applied a second layer of Nuln Oil. I also applied Nuln Oil to the gums and mouth. If you couldn't tell, I'd been putting off doing the whip, mainly because I couldn't figure out what colour I wanted to do it in. Having built up the brasses, I decided that a separate and slightly different brass was probably the way to go, particularly for the base of the weapon. I used Brass Scorpion to pick out some of the details on the axe head, while also painting the base of the whip. <laughs> 
I then applied an Agrax Earthshade wash to these new bronze details on the axe head and whip. Using Rune Fang Steel, I then came through with an edge highlight along all of the weapon edges, including the bronze. I then applied an Eshin Grey base coat to his teeth, nails and hooves. Having finished off the weapons and base coated his nails, it was at this point that I started to realise that the Rune Lord brass highlight that I'd applied to his bronze armour just seemed a little bit too silver for my liking. I applied Reichland Flesh Shade all over the brass armour, hoping to tone down the overall silverness of the Rune Lord brass. I find that you can use shades not just for building up shadow, but also to tint and tone colours where you're not particularly happy with outcomes. I then applied an Agrax Earthshade Wash to the nails, teeth and hooves. Next, I took Skaven Blight Dinge and applied a fine edge highlight to the nails and to his teeth, focusing on the edges and the larger teeth in particular. And then for the hooves, using the same Skaven Blight Dinge, I applied horizontal highlights rather than vertical ones. Following this, I added a final edge highlight of Carrack Stone to the nails and teeth, and again, a horizontal highlight to his hooves. I ended up feeling that the final kind of cream highlight to his hooves was just too bright, and so again came through with Reichland Flesh Shade to turn this down. Finally, I come to all of the skulls left over on the model. It's at this point that I started to cheat. Using a Shabti Bone, Karak Stone, and Screaming Skull, I base coated the skulls across the model, picking and choosing which ones I wanted to be which shade. Taking a variety of brown washes, including Agrax Earth Shade, Reichland Flesh Shade, and Seraphim Sepia, I applied washes to each individual skull. The trick here is to use one wash for each skull, giving you different tonal variations across the model. No highlighting needed, just a wash and a base coat. Now we come to his base, a step I really love in model building and model painting because it ties everything together and normally takes it from this strange floating model on a black plinth to something that actually looks like it's living in its realm. Using Mechanicus Standard Grey, I base coated out the sand across the entire base. Sand can be very difficult to paint, so I find the best trick is to actually water down your paints as you apply it, allowing it to flow into the recesses. You end up covering any mistakes with dry brushings or further base coats anyway, so it doesn't matter if it looks too thin. Mechanicus Standard Grey applied, I then used Stormberm and Fur, very grey-brown, to base coat the rocks. I then applied Null Noil to the entire base. The wash dry, I came through using Dawnstone Grey to dry brush the sand on the model. I then dry brushed the stones, Karak Stone. Is it about this point that I started to notice that strangely my dry brush had applied a red tinge, potentially either from the pot of water that I've been using as I painted this model, or from a poorly dried brush. Taking a different brush, I took the Dawnstone back to it and managed to rub out the strange pink dry brushing that had appeared on the sand. I next came to the thing I'd been avoiding across the entire model up until this point, which was his eyes, mainly because I just don't feel comfortable doing eyes most of the time. Again, I cheated. I used Sybarite Green to pick out the iris, and once that was dry, I applied a simple Bill Tan Green wash and left it at that. Finally, I painted the rim of the base black, something I think really helps to finish a model. Next up, I decided to try something different. So, taking Blood for the Blood God, I attempted many different ways of trying to splatter the paint onto the axe head. First attempt horizontally didn't work, so I managed to get him standing up and flick paint with a piece of paper towel to obscure any strange flecks. I focused this mainly around the axe head, and on the, in this case, the leading edge of the axe head. My final, final step was to apply static grass to the base. I started out with the darker grass, dabbing small spots of PVA glue using a toothpick onto the base to form clumps in irregular patches across the base. I then dug this into a bag, wiggled it around, pulled it out and brushed off any excess back into the bag. I followed this by using a lighter grass to pick out some other spots across the base in the same manner. 
really happy with how this turned out and I think it's a massive improvement from what I found underneath my dad's workbench. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you'll stick around to see what, what else I've got to show you in the coming weeks and months and maybe even years. We'll see how this goes. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to hit subscribe. Consider liking the video and leave a comment. Let me know what you're working on. I really want to hear it. See you next time on Lounge Room Hobbies.